Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Stephen Romo, in for Savannah Sellers today. Right now on Morning News Now, winter's wrath. This morning, tens of millions of Americans under weather alerts from a powerful cross-country storm slamming dozens of states with snow, ice, and wind. We have team coverage with a look at the conditions, plus where that system is headed next. Also this morning, accountability. A major rail company now facing the consequences of the train derailment turned health hazard affecting thousands of people in Ohio. The EPA ordering the company to clean up the mess and pay for it. We're going to demonstrate uh, to this community that North of Sub Norfolk Southern will be held accountable. They'll pay for it and they will do it in a transparent manner. We'll take you to Ohio for the latest. A war of words rages on between Russia and the West. The latest messages from President Biden and Russian President Vladimir Putin as the war in Ukraine approaches the one-year mark. And racing to educate, one influencer working to close the gap when it comes to race and financial literacy. More on the mission behind the Broke Black Girl platform. A lot going on this morning. Thanks for being here. And we do begin with that sprawling winter storm slamming parts of the U.S. this morning. Right now, more than 60 million Americans are waking up under winter weather alerts from the West Coast all the way to New England. In parts of the upper Midwest, the snow plows are out in full force as drivers are asked to stay off the roads. And you can see why. Take a look at this new video from the South Dakota Highway Patrol. It shows just how blinding that snow can be as we head into what officials are calling an unprecedented three-day snow event. This is indeed going to be a historic storm. It's going to be a tough storm, especially for those in open country. You know, the wind blows and it gets very, very tough, especially when you have a lot of heavy snow and very strong wind. Minnesota Governor Tim Walz issued emergency executive orders that allow state agencies to put equipment and personnel in place so they are ready to make rescues if needed. Forecasters say the storm could drop nearly two feet of snow on parts of southern Minnesota. We've got team coverage of this massive winter storm. Meteorologist Angie Lastman will have the full forecast in just a moment. But let's begin with NBC News correspondent Nyla Charles in Minneapolis. Nyla, good to see you. I know I've been talking with my family in Minnesota. They're hunkering down. How are things looking? Looking out there right now. <laughs> Well, Joe, it's cold here. It's in the teens and with wind chills expected in the negatives because of those wind gusts that are as high as 40 miles per hour. We're in for a very icy day. Take a look at the roads here in Minnesota. Most of them are either completely covered or partially covered. And that's despite snowplow workers working long 12 hour shifts to get all this snow out of the way. So that just gives you a sense of how fast the snow came down overnight and how it continues to come down here in the first round of snow. Joe, as we can see with all that snow behind you already, you know, the state's no stranger to severe weather, but this does have the makings of a potentially historic storm, right? I mean, how worried are officials there? Well, officials are definitely getting out the word. Don't go outside. Don't drive unless in its emergency. The governor of Minnesota has issued out uh, emergency orders. Even the National Guard is here on standby, Joe, in case they need to rescue people who are stranded. This is what the mayors of the Twin Cities are saying. We are bracing for what is likely to be one of the largest snowstorms in Minnesota history. We expect it to have major impacts across the Twin Cities on every aspect of life, every aspect of city operations uh, for the rest of this week. We are preparing for what will likely be an historic snow event. We've got multiple departments and multiple jurisdictions, both Minneapolis and St. Paul, doing everything possible to make sure that we are prepared. So strong words out there, Joe. Officials are trying to really get out a sense of urgency here. And like you know, since your family's from Minnesota, that's a hard thing to do here because the people in Minnesota pride themselves on getting through a Minnesota winter. I know that because I worked here as well. So yep. here the snow is a way of life. So somehow these officials need to convince people that in case the storm does reach historic levels, they don't necessarily know this storm as well as they think they do. Joe? You know, here's another sign of things to come. Schools in the Twin Cities 
cities are shifting to e-learning for the rest of the week already, so you know they're expecting a lot of snow. Real quickly, what are you hearing from just everyday folks in the area? Well, they're saying that every time in the winter, you know, all these different weeks, they've been hearing that they should expect a historic snow. So a lot of people here don't necessarily know if that's something they should believe. We know, although, like you mentioned, schools are closed, a lot of businesses are still open. Even the Mall of America is opened here. They reached out to businesses and retailers on social media, social media actually urging them to stay open so that people can come shop. And even the high school state hockey tournament is happening this afternoon at 11. So that just gives you a sense, Joe, of how there's a difference between what officials are saying and what people are actually doing. All right, Nyla Charles in Minneapolis. Thank you so much. And joining us now for more on all this is meteorologist Angie Lastman. Hey there, Angie. Hi there, guys. Yeah, we've got the alerts up for many people, but let's take a look at what's been going on over the past couple of days with some of the snow working in. You can see uh, this is some live pictures from uh, Minneapolis. The snow already falling there. We've received maybe two to three inches in this area so far. Uh, as we continue through, of course, the rest of the day, we're going to see more adding on to that. Uh, you can see a little bit more of the view there. Travel is going to be a little difficult in the coming days. So that's something to be aware of. Let's talk about uh, exactly where we go from here because those 60 million people are in the path of this system that's working its way to the east and spreading snow across the northern tier of the country. You can see basically uh, the plains all the way extending into the northeast is where we're going to see that snow. We also have a wintry mix that's going to cause some problems when it comes to ice accumulation and we even have some storms that could potentially bring us some severe weather. Eventually by the time we get into Thursday and Friday we'll start to wrap things up but we have a little burst of snow that we'll deal with on Thursday for parts of New England. Here's the snowfall totals. This is what we're expecting. As we look a little closer, you can see where some of those highest amounts are. Uh, 9 to 18 inches in Sioux Falls, Marquette up to 16 inches. Of course, the big bullseye right now is for Minneapolis, which definitely will receive over a foot of snow possibly closer to two feet. We'll see about that, though. Uh, two to four inches for Buffalo and up to a foot for uh, Burlington as well. We also, in addition to the wintry weather, have some really strong winds that we're dealing with, and 72 million people are included in these winter in these wind alerts that are up right now because gusts could be as high as 70 miles per hour. We dealt with this yesterday. The down branches, the power outages are all possible, but in addition to that, we'll see gusty conditions into the high plains where they're dealing with some of that snow falling, and we know the blowing snow makes for really difficult travel on the roadways so we'll have to watch for that uh, as we come into the next couple of days uh, we're also dealing with a severe threat for parts of the south and extending into uh, basically illinois from uh, parts of texas you can see eight million people are at risk for this it's mainly a wind and hail uh, issue that we'll watch for but a tornado or two not out of the question and as if we didn't have enough going on weather wise we're also dealing with near record february warmth and arctic temperatures on the west coast so meanwhile while in the southeast, these temperatures are well above normal, 20 degrees, even close to 30 degrees above normal in some spots. And we're going to take a run at not just some record highs for specific days, but potential record highs for the entire month of February for some of these cities. And it includes more than 100 cities. Uh, meanwhile, quite the extreme <laughs> as you look coast wow. to coast, guys, with uh, 40 cities looking at record or near record lows through the weekend. Hopefully some of the people in the cold parts planned ahead and flew to the warm parts. Yeah. For the next ahead of the storm. See, that would be smart. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Angie. Appreciate it. Well, it's been nearly three weeks since the Norfolk Southern train derailment happened in Ohio. And this morning, the cleanup in East Palestine continues as health concerns continue to grow due to the toxic chemicals that train was carrying. The Environmental Protection Agency says its ongoing testing of the air and water has not yet shown a threat to the community, but the agency is still taking the company to task. At a press conference yesterday, the head of the EPA announced an enforcement action against Norfolk Southern and ordered it to take full responsibility of that derailment. President Biden also weighed in yesterday in a series of tweets calling on Congress and rail companies to implement and follow rail safety measures. NBC News correspondent Ron Allen joins us now from Ohio with more on this. Ron, good morning to you. So the EPA administrator was back to the derailment site yesterday and he announced that sweeping enforcement action against the company. Do we know how this will play out and how it will affect the cleanup there? 
Essentially, the EPA is taking over the operation here to clean up the derailment site and ordering the company to come up with a detailed plan about how it's going to do that and how it's going to pay for that. Uh, there are also a lot of other legal authorities that the EPA has to essentially force the company to do this or the EPA will do it themselves and then fine the company as much as three times the cost. So it, it's essentially an order that forces the company to do this. The company has said that they are doing this anyway, but essentially at this point, uh, there's so uh, the EPA wants to make sure that this happens. And of course, the residents here are fearful that none of this will ever get done to their satisfaction either. Stephen? Speaking, and speaking of those concerns from the residents, we know the Ohio Health Department opened a clinic yesterday in East Palestine to address some of those health concerns. The EPA saying the ongoing testing of the air and the water hasn't shown a threat, but of course people there are very worried about this. What are they telling you? Yes, they are very worried, and that's another reason the EPA administrator was here, to try and reassure residents along with local officials. Uh, but again, the most of what he was here to do was to in, uh, lay out the, the basics of this order that the EPA is going to enforce. Take a listen to what some of the, some of what the EPA director had to say. Tons of headaches, just all kinds of negatives, man. Um, don't feel good, can't breathe. Headaches, um, when I evacuated, I got, went to Cleveland, the headaches kind of went away, came back uh, about 10 days later and the headaches came back. I can assure you no details will be overlooked. If the company fails to complete any action ordered by EPA, the agency will immediately step in, conduct the work ourselves, and then force Norfolk Southern to pay triple in cost. In no way, shape, or form will Norfolk Southern get off the hook for the mess that they created. Norfolk Southern released a statement after the order was issued saying in part that we are committed to doing what's right for the residents of East Palestine, also pointing out that uh, they are providing financial assistance to this community, so far about six and a half million dollars, and the company is saying that that's just a down payment and a beginning. But again, so many residents here do not believe that the company is going to follow through once the attention here dies down. And on the health concerns issue, yes, there was a clinic that was opened yesterday. Residents here have been demanding more help with medical concerns like sore throats, headaches, eye irritation, and so forth. And they're also concerned about the long-term impact of this derailment site on their health. What will be happening here five, 10 years from now? A lot of worry about that. So the clinic was set up to address those concerns as this situation continues to play itself out. Stephen? Certainly a long way to go for that cleanup. Ron, thanks so much. In Poland this morning, President Biden is meeting with NATO leaders, those who are part of the so-called Bucharest Nine, countries from the eastern flank of the alliance. The talks come after yesterday's major address marking the upcoming one-year anniversary of the Ukraine war. Speaking before tens of thousands of people, President Biden said that President Putin had failed to get the, quote, easy victory he predicted, but warned that difficult days were still ahead for Ukraine. As Ukraine continues to defend itself against the Russian onslaught and launch counteroffensives of its own, there will continue to be hard and very bitter days, victories and tragedies. But Ukraine is steel for the fight ahead. And the United States, together with our allies and partners, are going to continue to have Ukraine's back as it defends itself. For more on this, we are joined by NBC News foreign correspondent Josh Letterman, who's in Warsaw, Poland, and NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin in Kiev. Good morning to both of you. Josh, let's start with you. We know President Biden's speech came just hours after Putin delivered his own address. So what was President Biden's key message? Yeah, Joe, although the White House pushed back on the notion that President Biden's speech was some type of response to President Putin's just a few hours earlier, it sure felt like that way at times as Putin tried to make the argument that it was the West who started this conflict and is to blame for the ongoing violence in Ukraine. President Biden appearing just hours later uh, at the Royal Palace Garden here in Warsaw saying that it's exactly the opposite, that it is Russia who started this war and that the Western nations who have stepped up to help Ukraine are, are simply acting as a bulwark against the kind of autocracy uh, and totalitarianism reflected by President Putin's approach. Take a listen to what Biden had to say. 
This war is never a necessity. It's a tragedy. President Putin chose this war. Every day the war continues is his choice. He could end the war with a word. It's simple. If Russia stopped invading Ukraine, it would end the war. But unfortunately, there are no signs right now that this war will be ending anytime soon. And in fact, the tensions only seem to be increasing, with President Biden announcing there will be new U.S. and European sanctions on Russia coming later this week. And overnight, we learned that just ahead of President Biden's secret trip to Kyiv, Russia tested an intercontinental ballistic missile, a part of its arsenal of nuclear-capable weapons. The United States saying Russia did, in Inform the U.S. ahead of time that it planned to undergo that test. So, Aaron, there in Ukraine, how are they reacting to President Biden's speech, and how are leaders there feeling as we approach this this one-year mark? Well, Joe, they're certainly here in Ukraine matching the president's confidence and conviction, many of them pointing to the situation that was unfolding here a year ago. This time last year, the U.S. embassy had completely shut down. Embassy staff packed their bags and moved to Poland a full year later to see President Biden standing shoulder to shoulder with President Zelensky, air raid sirens blaring in the distance beneath the gold golden domes of St. Michael's is a huge act of confidence building for them. Uh, I was speaking to one senior Ukrainian advisor who said that that was a show that Ukraine was going to stay on the map, quote, forever. He also expressed his optimism about the next six months of this war, adamant that if Ukraine gets the ammunition and weapons that it has been asking for in a quick fashion, he believes that in six months' time, they could be approaching the end of the war and the end of the war in the eyes of the Ukrainians is the 1991 borders. He also said that he's currently in negotiations. The Ukrainian government is currently in negotiations with the White House about providing F-16 fighter jets. And he's also confident that ultimately uh, the United States will provide the Ukraine with the fighter jets that they're adamant they need to, to push the Russians back. Josh, I want to ask you about something that's happening away from Poland, away from Ukraine. We're watching an important visit by the Chinese foreign minister in Russia. We understand he just met with President Putin, right? What can you tell us? That's right. We just saw some video emerge on Russian state TV uh, of the Chinese diplomat meeting with President Putin. Uh, the two leaders saying that foreign nations are not going to be able to influence the relationship between China and Russia, one that those two countries have described as limitless. And President Putin, uh, in those remarks, uh, said that he is expecting and looking forward to a visit to Russia by Chinese President Xi Jinping. But Beijing is really in the middle of a delicate balancing act here, Joe, because uh, while China wants to maintain those close ties with ally Moscow, it also needs to maintain a relationship with Europe, particularly given the economic challenges in China. And just before the Chinese diplomat was in, China, was in Russia, he was here in Europe. He was at the Munich Security Conference trying to shore up those ties uh, with Europe. So uh, the West feels that China is kind of trying to have it both ways on this issue. And the Biden administration, for its part, has made the point that China likes to talk a big game about territorial integrity and sovereignty in other countries not interfering in its affairs. The Biden administration arguing that China is going to lose all credibility on that if it looks the other way while Russia invades its neighbor. All right. Josh and Aaron, thank you both for your reporting this morning. We appreciate it. The stock market is in the spotlight this morning after Wall Street had its worst day of the year yesterday. The Dow ended the day down nearly 700 points, driven by disappointing earnings reports from several mega retailers. Yeah, Ron Insana is a CNBC senior analyst and commentator, as well as a senior advisor to Schroeder's NA. He joins us now to help us put all this in perspective. Ron, thanks so much for being here. So the recent economic data has been mostly positive, but there are clearly some things that are keeping investors nervous. So What's making them worry here? Well, there's a little split uh, going on in Wall Street, gents, uh, right now, where we have concerns about rising interest rates and inflation being stickier than we thought. Growth not actually slowing down, as you mentioned, but 
growth in certain key areas among consumers starting to reverse course. In other words, when you talk about Walmart or Home Depot, there was less spending on, let's say, luxury goods at Walmart, like consumer electronics, more on groceries, slow down at Home Depot. And that has affected uh, market psychology insofar as no one's quite sure if we're heading towards a recession, no one's quite sure if inflation is accelerating. What they're most worried about is the Fed, irrespective of either, will continue to raise interest rates. And we saw a big pop in rates yesterday, and that could put downward pressure on the stock market for a time to come. Ron, you mentioned Home Depot. Is this at all tied into the larger decline in the housing market we're starting to see because of the rising rates? Yeah, to an extent. I mean, you have a slowdown in residential sales, both existing and new home sales. We have um, some concerns about that market, but you know, mostly during periods like this, when you see slowdown uh, activity in, in the sales of new homes, people tend to upgrade their existing homes. We're not quite seeing that at this point in the cycle. And so it, it just appears that people are spending less money having been pinched by inflation, and they've drawn down their savings rather sufficiently. So they're spending less on things that they deem to be uh, discretionary items as opposed to necessities. And, and speaking of the housing market, we know existing home sales have fallen for the 12th straight month in January. However, prices are increasing in most parts of the country. What's driving that trend? And could we expect anything from the rate increase to affect this next month? Well, it has. I mean, the, the increase in mortgage rates has reaccelerated again, and so the average 30-year fixed is about 6.6 percent. We're seeing a downtick again in, in housing. Mortgage applications have declined after popping up in the last couple of months. And there's, a, there's an odd, uh, again, dichotomy in the housing market. There's a shortage of available homes, which is holding prices up to a certain extent. But we are expecting prices to come down as demand softens throughout the year. If interest rates, mortgage rates, and prices hold like this, you're going to see first-time buyers in particular back away, and that's going to soften the real estate market further, which, as you said, yesterday we saw existing single-family home sales fall for the 12th straight month. Later in the week, we get new home sales data, and they're not expected to be much better either, given, again, that housing has just simply become too expensive for most. Too expensive and a complicated situation. Ron and Sana, thanks so much. So Coming up, speaking out, the foreperson of the Georgia grand jury gives an inside look at the investigation into former President Donald Trump and possible interference in the 2020 election. We were just people looking into something, and that's worth it. When we come back, what she is sharing about the process and the outcome in an NBC News exclusive. And a big tech on trial. The Supreme Court set to hear arguments in another case about online content. We'll break that down next on Morning News Now. We are back now with an NBC News exclusive, an interview with the forewoman of the Georgia grand jury that investigated possible interference in the 2020 election by former President Donald Trump and his allies. She's speaking out publicly for the first time. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander has the headline making interview. It was an incredibly closely watched yet very secretive process. But now we're getting new insight into the special grand jury here in Georgia that investigated former President Donald Trump from the four person herself who's speaking out in her first TV interview. After eight months of secrecy, a rare look inside the Georgia special grand jury charged with investigating whether former President Trump broke the law in trying to overturn his 2020 election loss in the state. What do you want people to know about this process and about your work? That really, really, when it came down to it, we were just people looking into something, and that's worth it. Emily Kors served as foreperson. She is limited in what she can share. A judge ordered deliberations must stay under wraps. But Kors confirms the jurors did recommend indictments against multiple people. It's not a short list. So we're talking about more than a dozen people? I would say that, yes. Are these recognizable names, names that people would know? There are certainly names that you would recognize, yes. She would not say whether that includes the former president, but did say this. I don't think that there are any giant plot twists coming. I don't think that there are any, like, giant... That's not the way I expected this to go at all. I, I don't think that's in store for anyone. And the group wrote a nine-page report, only part of which has been made public. It's now up to the DA to decide who, if anyone, should be indicted.
Back to you. All right, Blaine, thank you. All right, now to a history-making moment at the ballot box. NBC News is projecting that for the first time, Virginia has elected a black woman to Congress. Democrat Jennifer McClellan defeated Republican Leon Benjamin in Tuesday's special election in the 4th Congressional District. She'll fill the seat of Democratic Representative Donald McCheon, who died from cancer shortly after he won re-election back in November. Over in Wisconsin, a Donald Trump ally who advised Republicans on legal efforts to overturn the 2020 presidential race has advanced to the state Supreme Court general election. Daniel Kelly will now face Danit, Janet Pro, Protasevich on April 4th. And in California, another longtime congresswoman says she will run to replace retiring Senator Dianne Feinstein. Democratic Representative Barbara Lee announced her bid yesterday. She jumps into the highly anticipated race that already includes fellow lawmakers Katie Porter and Adam Schiff. Turning now to the Supreme Court, where the justices will hear arguments in a second case against a big tech company. Yesterday, they heard a case against Google. Today, it's a lawsuit against Twitter. And the outcomes could have major implications for the future of content on social media platforms. Let's bring in NBC News senior legal correspondent, Laura Jarrett. Laura, good morning to you. So first of all, walk us through this case today against Twitter. What is the family behind the lawsuit claiming? And really, what's at stake here? Hey, Joe, good morning. This case is all about how much social media companies essentially need to police what's going on on their platforms. How aggressive do they need to be in taking down certain content that people think is harmful? In this case, um, a Jordanian man was killed in a ISIS-inspired terrorist attack back in 2017 in Turkey at a nightclub. His family says that Twitter should be on the hook for that because it knew that its platform was being used for ISIS propaganda. It knew that essentially terrorism were running um, a recruitment effort through social media. And so, therefore, Twitter should be on the hook. Now, in this case, there isn't any allegation that the actual terrorist event, the attack on the nightclub, was planned on Twitter. They don't even make an allegation that the person who carried out the attack had a Twitter account. Instead, the argument is just that there was a general campaign going on on social media and that the social media companies needed to do better. Yeah, and so, I mean, this case involves claims that social media companies are using computer algorithms in a way that causes harm. How might that play out? Yeah, the problem here, of course, is that it's not at all clear that the algorithms actually know how to separate out speech that maybe on the one hand um, is terrorist propaganda as, as opposed to, you know, educational or newsworthy videos talking about terrorist propaganda. And so the worry from the social media companies is that if they're on the hook here in terms of a, a legal case, that they'd actually have to sweep up much more content than you would want, including some content that we would find particularly newsworthy. If if in fact, they could be find li found liable here. And, you know, the justices heard a parallel case yesterday with similar claims against Google and YouTube. Did we get a sense from the line of questioning how the justices might rule? I mean, as you pointed out yesterday, this isn't necessarily a liberal versus conservative type of issue. And then when can we expect decisions on these cases? Yeah, it was interesting to see all of the justices very engaged, uh, a hot bench, as we might call it, across the political spectrum. The justices were really skeptical um, of this idea that simply recommending videos on YouTube would be uh, enough to make out a claim here. They essentially make the point that these algorithms are so much a part of our lives that the companies are always sorting and prioritizing because there's just so much content. And so they seem skeptical to think that that could give rise to a claim of liability. You can expect decisions in both cases uh, probably sometime later in June. And I should point out the case today is pretty interesting because they're essentially the same the same argument about the terrorist videos. And so if the plaintiff's claims in this case fail, there's an argument to be made that they wouldn't even have to reach the larger question of Section 230, that law that protects the companies. The idea there being that if, in fact, these social media companies are not aiding and abetting terrorism at all, then you don't even have to get to the question about whether the companies have a defense. So watch for that to play out in just a couple months, Jeff. I mean, Laura, is there the possibility that any decision here could just be seismic for these tech companies and for how we get information on social media? Uh, that's certainly the argument that the tech companies ha have made here. They've essentially said this would upend everything uh, if they're prevented from making any recommendations. But again, the justices seemed really skeptical to want to take such a big step here. And so uh, you might see something of a, a more pared back decision if they reach that question at all. All right, Laura Jarrett, breaking it all down for us. Thank you so much. Sure.
All right, turning now to international headlines. In Somalia, at least 10 people were killed in an attack by extremists. NBC's Claudia Lavanga joins us from Rome with that and other world headlines. Claudio, good morning. Good morning. Yes, the information, information ministry in Somalia confirmed that at least 10 civilians were killed in that attack on Tuesday in the capital Mogadishu. Al-Shabaab, a group uh, linked to Al-Qaeda, has claimed so far responsibility. And according to Reuters, a witness said a suicide bomber first detonated a car outside the house in the country's capital before militants stormed in while firing guns. Now to South Korea, where starting from next month, travelers from China will no longer be required to test for COVID-19 upon arrival. South Korea is among several countries that imposed COVID tests on people coming from China after the country lifted its zero COVID policy late last year. But travelers still need to take pre-departure tests. And let's finish off here in Italy where Starbucks says it is launching a line of coffee drinks with olive oil in it. The range called Oleato will be launched on Wednesday and features a nice shaken espresso and a latte with olive oil steamed with oat milk. Now, Starbucks bravely opened so far 20 stores in Italy in a country with a proud coffee culture. Now it's going even further by adding to coffee another typical Italian product, olive oil. Can't <laughs> wait to try it. Interesting. I put olive oil in a lot of things. I I'll have not done coffee yet. So I had avocado in a chocolate cake once. It was I'm great. thinking about oh. dressing my salad with coffee now. There I'll you go. Do <laughs> put it all together. It works. All right, Claudio. Thanks so much. Coming up on Morning News Now, new developments in the Alec Murdoch murder trial as his surviving son takes the witness stand. More of his emotional testimony and how that could impact the trial. And the best medicine parents may not need to head to the pharmacy for when their kids have a fever. We're breaking down a new study coming up after this break. Welcome back. Testimony is set to resume this morning in the Alec Murdoch double murder trial. His son Buster took the stand yesterday in his father's defense. Yeah, he said his dad was devastated by the deaths of his wife and youngest son. NBC News correspondent Katie Beck has the latest from South Carolina. Inside the courtroom for 21 days, Buster Murdoch listening to painful testimony. I go by Buster. Tuesday, more than 60 witnesses later, Alec Murdoch's surviving son on the stand, describing his father on the night of the murders. What was his demeanor? Yeah, his demeanor was, I mean, he was destroyed. He was heartbroken. I walked in the door and saw him and um, gave him a hug and just, just broken down. Could he speak? Not really. Is he crying? Yes, sir. Showing little emotion, Buster's testimony framing details that prosecutors highlighted as questionable as normal, saying it was common for his father to shower and change clothes after working outside in the heat and routine to find guns left around the property and offering a differing opinion on the I did him so bad comment investigators claim to have heard Alex say in an interview referring to Paul's murder. <laughs> What'd your dad say? He said they did them so bad. They did them so bad. Is that the first time you'd heard him say they did him so bad? No, sir. Later on the stand for the defense, a forensic engineer testifying about the upward trajectory of the bullets that killed Paul. It just just makes it very unlikely that a tall person made that shot. Prosecutors attacking his credibility as an expert witness. You don't even know the cone and the rate of expansion of a shotgun. How can you give that opinion? You don't need to know that. Buster Murdoch testified that he was aware of his father's opioid use and that he went to a detox facility in 2018 to try and get help. Buster also testified to the fact that he had no knowledge of Murdoch's alleged financial crimes until after the murders. Back to you. All right, Katie, thanks so much. For more on the trial, we're joined now by NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Danny, good morning. So let's start with Murdoch's son, Buster, his testimony. He's the third witness called by the defense so far. The defense tried to use him to attempt to undermine previous testimony from a witness who believed that Murdoch actually confessed to the murders. Do you think this was effective? Not only was it effective, uh, the defense apparently doesn't have a lot of choices in this area. The thing I was looking out for is how strong, how fast would they come out of the gate with a third party responsibility theory, if at all. So far, it appears that they're just going to put on testimony that, look, we don't know who it was, but it wasn't Murdoch. You did see a little bit from the engineers suggesting 
a third party case, but not as strong as I would have expected. But you're absolutely right. Buster's testimony is important in identifying Alex's voice, what he said in that supposed confession. I did them wrong versus they did them so wrong. That was helpful. But there's a possibility the jury may conclude, look, it's his son. Uh, he's, we've seen him in the courtroom the entire time. He's obviously supporting his father. Maybe he's just blinded or bamboozled by his father, just like so many other people were. Look for the prosecution to maybe make that point in their closing. Well, Danny, Buster also testified about his father's past drug use. So what's the defense's strategy there? What are, how are they trying to portray Murdoch? Possibly as a sympathetic figure, and their theory will be, look, Murdoch was a drug addict. Murdoch had financial problems. Murdoch had, faces a number of other charges in connection with his other bad behavior. But he was an addict, and that is something that he had to live with. It doesn't make him a killer. Or it could just be partially that the defense is just putting this out there, acknowledging what the prosecution has already made evident, that, look, this is a person who had a lot of problems, but he didn't have this problem. He wasn't a murderer. Danny, let's also ask you about something else we heard in Katie's report. There, a forensic engineer testified about the trajectory of the bullets that bullets that killed Murdoch's other son, Paul. How valuable was this testimony? I've heard this kind of testimony before, where an engineer or some other expert calculates the trajectory and concludes that somebody wasn't tall enough to have committed this crime. Sometimes it's a shooter. Sometimes it's with a striking, a blunt object uh, based on the injuries to the head. It's interesting because, you know, you might see the prosecution hammer home that, look, people move around in strange positions. That throws off the angles. Uh, the prosecution did get him to concede that he was not a crime scene expert. He's more of an engineer. That might have gone some distance with the jury. But, uh, again, this, is, this may come down to a battle of the experts. In other words, the jury heard from experts in the prosecution. Does the defense's expert create reasonable doubt? Because they don't have to win. They just need to create reasonable doubt. All right. Danny, breaking it down for us. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Time now for our weekly medical checkup. A new study shows you may not always need to give your child medicine to treat a fever. And you know, we love our sleep studies on Morning News Now. And this morning, we have one that looks at how the amount of sleep we need changes depending on the time of year. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar joins us here with more on these health headlines. So let's start with this one. You know, I mean, many parents head straight to the medicine cabinet when a child has a fever. So now we have a new study shows that some of this medicine might not be needed. What more can Yeah, you know, and this is surprising to me as a mom. I mean, your instinct when your child has a fever and looks uncomfortable is to give them medication to, to, to lower the fever. This is the number I want everyone to remember. 100.4 is what we consider a temperature in medicine. So a lot of times they found that a third of patients were giving fever when it's not needed, i.e. for temperatures below 100.4. And something to keep in mind for everybody is that lowering that that temperature, treating that fever. Fever is not an illness. Fever is actually a sign that your immune system is responding to something. It's not going to make you get better any more quickly. So doctor's orders for our viewers at home are pretty straightforward. Um, if you have, if your child has a low grade temperature, i.e. below 100.4, and they look a little bit uncomfortable, give them a washcloth, put them in a cool bath, keep a log of their fevers, and definitely know when to call the doctor. So I mentioned the 100.4 is kind of like the litmus but something that's really important is that for infants below the age of three months a fever of of 100.4 need you need to call the doctor right away that's can be that can be very very serious all right good advice there also wanted to ask you about this one obviously four-day work weeks popular with a lot of employees <laughs> yes. there's the largest study yet on this topic showing that it could also be beneficial to the companies involved what's going on here right so I mean I, medicine aside because we were back in the hospital like right away when the pandemic started my husband is still pretty much working from home and I think a lot of people ask themselves well what were the what was the actual outcome of this so a study in the UK actually tried to figure this out and look at these statistics you guys they found that 71% of individuals experience less burnout, 39% were less stressed, there was a reduction in 65% of sick days, and also 57% less people were leaving the company, which is great, right? You're like, you're retaining your employees. Um, and even so, and the company revenue barely even was affected. And there was even 
even a marginal improvement. So doctor's orders here are a little bit tricky. Because you can't, <laughs> Can you, you can't, order a company to do something, job, doctor? Right, you can't say, I'm definitely working from home, and blah, blah, blah. But, um, you know, if you, if you do need to still be back in, in the office, you know, try to set a realistic schedule. Um, do talk to your employer and say, listen, is there some flexibility here? And take breaks when you need them. I think one of the biggest things we find is that sort of needing to be there and, and, and you know, that FaceTime that you're constantly there. Take a break when you need it. But take a break when you need it. Focusing on this, this four-day work week, I yeah. mean, it just, there just seems to be so many benefits to having that one extra day, right? 100%. I mean, it's just like spending time with your children, being able to do, you know, doing stuff at home, preparing dinner, like taking a break, doing... A, I know my one of my closest friends would do work calls while she was taking a walk, yeah. right? So you're, you're, you're on, you're engaged, but you're still accomplishing something else. And it's just so much better for your physical and your mental well-being. Speaking of something we need more of, that would be sleep. Okay, so yes. humans don't hibernate, no. but there's research showing that in the winter, perhaps do we need more sleep? Yeah, so maybe we do. And maybe we're <laughs> not, so, not so distant from our, our hibernating, um, you know, uh, fellow, what, they're not humans, fellow our, animals. Our, our bear brothers our, and sisters. Our, exactly. Yeah, okay. um, so this was interesting. So why are we even talking about this? Well, it has to do with the amount of REM sleep that, that individuals are getting. This was a study out of Germany which found that in the winter time, people slept, had longer duration of REM sleep in the winter time, 30 minutes. And why is that important? Well, REM sleep is incredibly important for dreaming, memory, emotional processing, as well as healthy brain development. So the doctor's orders here are so simple. <laughs> REM sleep and sleep in general is linked to our circadian rhythm, which is linked to light. You gotta go to bed earlier. Okay. The, the way to sort of account for this or, or to respond to this potential biological need for more sleep is just simply to go to bed earlier. And if we all remember that a little bit in the winter months, we actually might reap the benefits of it. All right. Yeah. So we do, her, we do hibernate. We do. You get to be in cozy, in cozy, warm bed sheets. Exactly. I mean, that's our instinct pillows. anyway. Yeah, but I think we, we resist that, right? right? And we still get up early and we still watch our TV, but yeah, that TV try to go to bed a little Doctor early. says you get to go to bed early today. Yeah. So, all right, Dr. Azar, <laughs> as always. four days. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so much good advice today. All right, thank you, doctor. Well, coming up this morning, she's racing toward financial freedom and teaching others to do the same. When we come back, we're going to introduce you to one woman on a mission to close the gap when it comes to race and money. You are watching Morning News Now. We're back now with some financial headlines and some Amazon employees are sounding off about a new mandate. CNBC Silvana Hanau joins us with that and other money headlines. Silvana, good morning. Hey, Joe, Stephen, good morning to you. Let's start with Amazon because employees are not happy about having to return to, uh, to the office three days a week. CNBC has learned more than 14,000 workers have reportedly joined a Slack channel to share their displeasure, and some created a petition claiming a return to the office runs contrary to many of Amazon's core values. Last week, CEO Andy Jassy outlined the plan in a blog post with a start date on May 1st. He says people tend to be more engaged when they're face to face. McKinsey, the management consulting firm known for recommending layoffs to struggling companies, plans to cut about 2,000 jobs as part of its own restructuring plan. Bloomberg reports the layoffs will focus on the firm's support staff and will be among the company's largest round of cuts ever. McKinsey employs about 45,000 people, up from about 28,000 just five years ago. And Apple has been investing a lot in live sports, and it's interested in acquiring more content, even after passing on the NFL. The New York Post reports Apple is rumored to potentially buy the streaming rights to Pac-12 college football as a conference is currently without a TV partner. The Pac-12's current deal with ESPN and Fox runs through next season, guys. All right. Thank you, Savannah. You got we'll it. See you next time. Part of our Black History Month coverage, we are highlighting people actively working to close inequality gaps in America. Yeah, a great story here. This morning, we continue with looking at the importance of financial literacy, specifically for African Americans. NBC News reporter Maya England has more. I did not grow up in a household where we talked about money. Daisha Kennedy created a platform called The Broke Black Girl after spending years in banking and noticing the lack of culturally relevant resources. 
When I think of culturally relevant, I think that it centers me as a black person, a black woman, and the challenges that I face day to day, creating tools that are easily usable for me. A lot of our frustration and aggravation comes from us using unhealthy timelines and expectations that was placed on us either by other people or by social media. One study found that on average, black people answered 38% of personal finance questions correctly, while white people answered serve 55% correctly. What has led to this gap in financial literacy for the black community? Being denied access to wealth building opportunities such as higher paying jobs, home ownership. Daisha says a lot of this can also be tied to education. Another report found that only 25 states required students to complete a personal finance course prior to high school graduation as of 2022. How do you think we can close this gap in financial literacy? Education is not a special privilege. It's a right that we all should care about when we are wanting to see change for our economy. And that when I think of literacy and education, we have a responsibility as educators to make sure that no one is left behind. My hope for the future is the reason why I had to do this work starts to go away. That we start to understand and accept in our world that this is a necessity. I get to see black women get relief in, in real time, which is not always a luxury that we get to enjoy. I get to see in real time that by using some of the resources that I have created, that they're able to grant themselves some financial relief and even mental relief. Maya Eaglin, NBC News. Coming up on Morning News Now, diversifying the slopes. Yeah, up next, we'll introduce you to a brotherhood of skiers working to get more people of color interested in winter sports. Welcome back. Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders is no stranger to becoming a meme, and well, now it has happened again. Sanders was caught accidentally walking behind a TikTok video that was being filmed on the streets of New York City. Taylor Champ posted the video of her dancing with a doorman, not realizing who was standing behind them, seemingly unimpressed. She captured the video saying, I really wish in the moment I realized who was walking by. Of course, back in 2021, Sanders became one of the most famous memes in history when he was pictured in mittens enduring the cold weather at President Biden's viola uh, uh, inauguration. Now, if yeah. only he had the mittens in the TikTok Ooh. dancing video, you could Full combine circle. that all and it'd be all, yeah. I think the dancing one might beat the mitten one. It, it's, it's that pretty was pretty good. good. Yeah, it's pretty I mean, good. Though, to be fair, I think that's always his expression. So. Yeah, it's just priceless. <laughs> I love right. that. All right, Joe, thanks. Yep. Well, finally, this hour, a legacy on the slopes for 50 years. The National Brotherhood of Skiers has helped promote something important, that black people enjoy winter sports just as much as anybody else. That simple message is helping to make the slopes a better, more diverse place. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson joined their annual convention. Watching a troop of talented young skiers shred up the slopes of Vail is a thing of beauty. Realizing they're all black is a vision. It's super fun. But this is still a rare sight. This past ski season, the National Ski Areas Association says that 89% of visitors to U.S. ski areas identify as white, a problem Ben Finley and Art Clay set out to solve half a century ago, starting the National Brotherhood of Skiers to advocate for greater representation in winter sports and dispel the idea that black people don't ski. We are skiers who happen to be black. People sometimes get us confused. Well, you're just black people who happen to ski. No, we are skiers who happen to be black. Every year, they bring thousands of black skiers together. What we tried to do was make it all a party. You know, just, hey, well, why are we out here partying? Why don't you try some of these skis? <laughs> and it worked. It's a brotherhood, yeah. sisterhood. Yeah. It's all good. Groups from Denver to Detroit. This is wonderful. We love it. Even as far away as London. We ski. We ski high. Their goals are growing. They hope to see black athletes on Olympic podiums. 20-year-old freestyle skier Keegan Seppel is the dream. What's it like to just like fly through the air like that? It looks crazy. I mean, it's, it's one of the best things ever. It's the most freedom you'll ever feel. He's one of several NBS-sponsored athletes with U.S. team ambitions and talent. I didn't really have any role models growing up. Now he's surrounded by them. 
proof that finding serenity on the slopes has never been skin deep. Steve Patterson, NBC News, Vail, Colorado. Awesome story there. Thank you, Steve. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But your news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.